Welcome to the online worship service of University United Methodist Church in Austin, Texas. I'm Pastor Lisa, one of the associate pastors here at this church, and we are glad that you are here. This is a place where whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith journey and in your life journey, you are welcome here. Today, we continue our sermon series, Scripture with a Twist, and Pastor John will be exploring how the story of Cain and Abel applies to racism today. Our opening hymn today is called Goodness is Stronger Than Evil. It's a poem written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and set to music by John Bell. I hope the words and the music of this service feed your soul today as we worship together. Let us sing. Holy One, we gather to give you thanks and to celebrate the gift of your love, a love that supports, nurtures, and challenges us. We offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing presence in our lives. Today we give thanks for mothers. We give thanks for all those who have nurtured and cared for us, remembering especially birth mothers, adoptive mothers, surrogate mothers, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, neighbors, and all women who have shared their faith with us. For those who have lost their mothers, we pray they may feel the comfort of your love and a spirit of peace surrounding them as they remember their mother's love. We pray, compassionate God, for those who have been hurt, disillusioned, or disappointed in their role as mother. We pray for those who have been denied a long-for chance at motherhood, and for those whose years of mothering have been cut short by the loss of a child. We lift up before you, O oh God, the members of our human family around the world, for those who are afflicted or suffering, for those who need healing, for those who require bread or shelter, for those who live in violent homes and communities, and for those who are grieving and for those whose needs are known only to you. We lift to you the names of those we hold in our hearts. Holy Mother of us all, touch us with your healing spirit that we may walk in your ways, bringing dignity, justice, and peace to all corners of your world. All of this we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to share the peace of Christ with your neighbors online, on the chat, in your house, wherever you are, friends. The peace of Christ be with you.
The birth of a child is an event so wonderful, so humbling, and yet so awe-inspiring that all faith traditions of the world have a ritual of welcome and blessing. We join our hearts and voices with faith communities of every kind and in every age as we offer thanks and seek blessings today. Baptism is a sacrament of the church. It's a sign of God's love acting in our lives. Through baptism, we're received into the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. For us, the water is symbolic of life itself, the waters of a mother's womb, as well as the water out of which all of life is created and sustained. Water is also the symbol of the life-giving power of God's love working in the world. As we pour this water, may, may it be a reminder that God's love is poured out on all creation and that love overflows in us in love for all of our neighbors. Friends, we are so happy today to be celebrating the birth of James Boyle. We had the privilege of baptizing her big sister, Charlie, a couple of years ago. And their parents are Amber and Rob. So Amber and Rob, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you these questions. Do you accept God's call to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, you say, I do. I do. I do. Do you accept Jesus as the sign of God's unconditional grace and as the source of your freedom to act boldly in the world? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. Do you promise your love, support, and care of James as she grows in Christ? If so, you say, we do. We, we do. do. Then by the grace of God, do you promise to follow Christ and to grow with her in the Christian faith? Will you help her to be a faithful member of this community and celebrate the presence of God's Spirit in all of life? If so, say, by God's grace, we will. By, by God's, God's grace, we will. will. University United Methodist Church, each of us has an important role to fulfill. These people need a community of love and forgiveness as they grow in their faith and service to God. Will all of you help provide this community to teach these people to be faithful witnesses to God's love and justice? And church, you say, by God's help, we will. By God's, by God's help, help, we will. then let us take a moment to profess our faith together. We are, we are not, not alone. alone. We, we live, live in God's world. world. We, we believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to love with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Holy One, Mother and Father of all the faithful for this child and for your grace present here today. Pour out your spirit to bless this gift of water in the one who receives it, to liberate and guide her throughout her life into the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life through Jesus Christ, who makes us one. Amen. Amber and Rob, what name has been given this precious child? James, James and Lou. James Lou, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. May God work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you may ever be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Amen. As your new church family, it is our joy to welcome you in Christ. Church, through baptism, you are incorporated into Christ's new creation by the power of God's Spirit. With joy and thanks, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. 
As in baptism you put on Christ, so in Christ may you be clothed with glory. Amen. Amen. I invite you to welcome James and Amber and Rob as our new church community by clapping and by saying so in the chat box. Let us pray. Startle us, O oh God, with truth so big, so glorious, words will never contain it. Startle us with love that overcomes all, even death. In this Easter season, open our eyes to see your loving, reconciling work in the world. Open our ears so we may hear your voice in the voices of others. Open our hearts to a love that assures us there is nothing to fear ever, for Jesus is not dead, but risen. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of Yahweh. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And Yahweh had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, Yahweh had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. God said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then God said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on this earth. Cain said to Yahweh, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then Yahweh said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And God put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of Yahweh, and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The word of life. Thanks be to God. goodness did you see that we are twisting up a storm and you all are getting better and better every week but guess what next week is the last week so you need to sign up right now to twist sign up with Megan let her know that you're gonna twist 
and have a blast with it. May the grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God be with you all. Amen. One of the great things we had planned as a church before the pandemic hit was a civil rights journey led by our new best friend, Ray Jordan. One of the stops on that trip I was so looking forward to was the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Among other things, the museum hosts an active remembrance of sites where there have been lynchings. Between 1877 and 1950, over 4,400 African descended persons were lynched. Historical markers have been placed across the country. There's one outside Wesley United Methodist Church and Many of you were there for the dedication with representatives of the Equal Justice Initiative. The other piece of the project is bringing soil from those sites back to the museum. The soil is placed in jars with the name, the date, and the location where the victim or victims were lynched. The soils all vary in color, but each one brings what happened on that ground to a powerful, and sacred sense of immediacy. One person who visited the memorial reflected that the jars of soil evoked for them the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers, the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain murdered Abel in a, in a field, and when God confronted Cain, God said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. This story is one of the primary texts that enslavers used to justify slavery. The story of Noah and the curse of Ham, that was the main one, but the mark of Cain also figured in that, that desperate and immoral formulation because we all know not that the mark of Cain was dark skin. Traditionally, preaching on this story leans toward the ending, where Cain complains to God that his punishment is too much, that he will become a fugitive and, and be killed. And so God, out of sheer grace, marks Cain with a sign that would protect him. Now, there's another way to understand this story, especially in light of the exhibit. To be very blunt, we are Cain. We, white Americans, have murdered our black and brown siblings. The genocide of Native Americans, the enslavement and, and subsequent terrorization of black Americans. We, white Americans, are Cain. And the very soil cries out. You know, sometimes scripture comforts the afflicted. Other times, like this morning, it afflicts the comfortable. The question God asks of Cain is surprisingly relevant for us. What have we done? What have we done? All of you know the awful history of slavery prior to the Civil War and the the second slavery that followed, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, mass incarceration. But did you know that the Methodist Church has supported racism and white supremacy for much of its history? Ah, oh, yeah, we don't like to hear this part, right? That our churches, our conferences, and our leaders were, they were not simply neutral, not simply kind of riding on the fence or silent on white supremacy, but were complicit. Their words and official pronouncements said one thing, their actions a whole other. The Methodist movement was founded by John Wesley in the mid 18th century. Wesley thought that slavery and the slave trade, which Britain participated in, were national disgraces. He once preached against the slave trade in Bristol and a service ending fist fight broke out during worship. Can you imagine? 
American Methodists basically turned a blind eye to slaveholding in the early 19th century. Our church split in 1844 over slavery. We came back together in 1939, but only by creating a Jim Crow church where black Methodists were segregated from white Methodists in a separate jurisdiction. We were late to denounce lynching. And while we decried the Klan in public, we provided meeting space for them in our churches in private. Of course, there are stories of those individuals and churches who rose up against the tide of racism, but those stories are far too few. So when God asks of us, what have we done? We must confess that as a church, we have not been courageous. We have not done justice. We have, in the words of the old prayer, followed too much the devices and desires of our hearts. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. The church, the Methodist church, needs to take public responsibility, owning up to the hurt, the harm, the theft, driven by white supremacy that we supported. As a congregation, University Church, I'm sure, has its hands dirty. But we've also been at work for decades on, on changing this dynamic. Most recently, we spent Lent in, in study and dialogue about the other R word that may be even more distasteful to Americans than racism, reparations. I'm hoping that you'll take some time and, and read up on reparations. I'm not going to review all that stuff for you. And if you haven't already done it, take a look at the, at the piece by ta Coates in The Atlantic several years ago. That's a great starting point. Or, or look at the work by Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project in The New York Times. Our anti-racism team has divided our future work into groups. We'll be pursuing education, advocacy, and church practices. And you are, are certainly more than welcome to join up in, in this work. And Kristen Bowdry, our, our deaconess, will be talking about it later in the service. My hope and prayer is that University Church will be a leader in supporting the work of reparations. It's not only the good and right thing to do, my friends, it is biblical. It's enshrined in Old Testament law. You know, there's all those awful laws, but there's some good stuff in there too. It's in the New Testament. Do you remember Zacchaeus? The man of small stature memorialized in the children's song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Yeah. When he confessed his allegiance to Jesus, he gave away half his possessions. And he repaid those whom he had cheated four times the amount. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Name isn't that the clarion call? Uh, isn't the clarion call of that story to bind up the wounds of the downtrodden? Hello, only an interpretation of the Bible, heavily underwritten by white supremacy, can explain the fact that about four percent of white evangelicals support the idea of reparations. And as I say that, I'm wondering what the percentage is of progressive United Methodists, because I can bet you that it's not 100%. We got our work to do. Now, you may be wondering at this point if a sermon on this is really ne necessary. I mean, after all, Pastor John, you do recall that we are a progressive church, right? I mean, we have Black Lives Matter signs. We've set them out on the lawn for a couple of days at least until someone steals them. We're all on board, right? 1619 Project, check. 
Critical race theory, check. I, I know, I hear what you're saying. I, I mean, I thought I was. Back in 2014, after the murder of Michael Brown and Ferguson, we formed a study group and we talked about ta Coates' book, Between the World and Me. I thought I was all on board, all ready to roll as an ally, but the more I read, the more I listened, the greater the gap I found between what I knew and what I really needed to know. Okay, I didn't know that my own brand of progressive liberal Christianity has often been complacent, even naive about racism, confusing Facebook likes and online surveys with real action, confusing believing the right thing with doing the right thing. I hadn't really thought about the fact that saying, I don't see color is absolute nonsense and terrifically unhelpful. Everyone sees color. We cannot deconstruct a system of privilege and power rooted in skin color by ignoring skin color. I didn't know that affirmative action had helped me and my family more than it had ever helped people of color. White Americans have had centuries of government assistance to create the wealth that we now enjoy, opportunities that were closed to black Americans. And finally, I'll say perhaps the most insidious, because there's a whole lot more that I didn't know. I didn't know that a huge part of my white privilege was that I could think about racism for a day or two or maybe an hour on Sunday morning and then just take a vacation. Never give it another thought because it didn't directly impact my life or at least so I thought. James Baldwin reminds us again and again of how twisted our white lives, our white lives have become because we have been married too long to the lie of white supremacy. Now, earlier in the sermon, I think I said that we know what to do, right? But maybe we don't know what to do. Maybe we have no clue because, because racism seems to be such a huge, complex problem that has been pl in place in America for 400 years. And what in the world can I possibly do. So let's be clear first what we're talking about. Racism is a system put in place by white humans, shaped piece by piece over the centuries to advantage white people. And so racism can be dismantled by white humans piece by piece. Again, as, as James Baldwin said, we made this world that we're living in and we must make it over again. How? Okay, here are a few closing thoughts, mostly from Iljiama, Oluo, and others. Decolonize your bookshelf and your Netflix playlist. Read black authors and black history and not just in February and watch documentaries like 13 that tell stories that none of us learned in school and that I guarantee are not in Texas history books. Conversations about racial justice are uncomfortable, especially for white people. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable and jump in those conversations. Be okay with saying, wow, I have a lot to learn. Vote. Vote. Find out where the candidates in your area are on racial justice and email them anyway and, and tell them that to get your vote, racial justice must be a priority. Find out what schools are teaching your children. 
about the history and the accomplishments of people of color. Support POC-owned businesses and banks. Give money to nonprofits that are actually doing the work of dismantling racism. Support a living wage. Support affordable housing. Support the expansion of me Medicare. It's all connected, right? You know, my, my hope is with you and with congregations like ours that we will do this work together not only the work that we need to do in us, but in our church, in the United Methodist Church, in Austin, that we will do the work of anti-racism, of dismantling racism, because this is what it means to be a Christian. Because black lives matter. Because this is what it means to transform the world. Because this work will bring life for everyone. In John's gospel, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I believe, my friends, that this work is exactly what he was talking about. May it ever be so. Amen. Hear now this prayer of confession. O oh God, who created and loves all people, we come before you today confessing the sin of racism in our country, our church, and in ourselves. Forgive us for our part in it, for the ways we have contributed to the oppression of others, whether knowingly or unknowingly. We want to be different and for our nation to be different, but it is hard when we face the injustice of institutions as well as the prejudice in ourselves. Help us to see the reality of racism and bigotry wherever it exists and to have the courage to challenge it. Through your Holy Spirit, may we be given the grace and power to change within ourselves and also to join with others to do the work of love and justice in the world to move toward the goal of bringing an end to racism. In the name of your Son, Jesus, who came for all people. Amen. And now, for If you would like to participate in a love offering for Pastor John and Linda as they move into their retired life together, simply go to uumc.org and find the donate button. On the menu there, you will see special offering and you can click that and write love offering for Pastor John in the memo line. You are always welcome to send a check to the church. We thank you for supporting the mission and ministries of University United Methodist Church. Thank you. Oh
Kristen Bowdry and I lead our racial justice group here at UUMC. This Lent, we took a deep dive into the subject of reparations for slavery. We are continuing our racial justice efforts through education, advocacy, and looking internally at our practices here at UUMC. We would love to have you join us. If you'd like to get involved, you can email me at kristenmbowdry at gmail.com. Now, if you'll join us in our closing hymn, it's based on the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in his timeless speech, I Have a Dream. of benediction and blessing from our friends at Mayflower United Congregational Church in Oklahoma. May the power of God and the peace of Christ, which truly does surpass our understanding, go with us. 
abide with us. Lift us up and make us whole. Let us go in peace. Pray for peace. Wage a little peace and love one another, every single other. Amen. Thank you.